1, beginning at verse 1 and coming down through about, uh, about verse 4. Revelation chapter 21, uh, John writing from Patmos, and he says, uh, I, John, he said, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem. Well, he says the heaven and earth passed away. It was a new heaven, new earth, no more sea. And then he said, I, John, saw New Jerusalem uh, descending from God out of heaven like a bride adorned for her husband. And he goes on down there and he says, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he'll be their God, and they shall be his people. And then he says in verse 4, he says, And God himself shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there'll be no more sorrow, uh, be no more uh, death, nor sorrow, nor crying, nor pain. He says, For the former things have passed away. And he that sat upon the throne said, Write, I make all things new. And he said, These words are true and faithful. Now those verses there tell you how it's going to end. And you wouldn't think of much of a book that had the last chapter missing. In a modern novel, uh, you'd be distracted if you got to the end of the book and then the last chapter was gone. What if you read the detective story, you got the last chapter, and then never, you, you never found out who done it? You just left out in the dark. It'd be a pretty punk book. And you know when the Lord writes a book, the Lord writes a good book. And when the Lord writes his book, he tells you how it's going to end. And like a little child said one time in Sunday school, all of God's stories have happy endings. Now, man's don't, but God's do. When God tells a story about his people, it always has a happy ending to it. And you know there's something about that so deeply ingrained in human nature that if a movie or a play or a book has an ending that's not a happy ending, we call it a tragedy, and it leaves something unfulfilled and unsatisfied in our, in our, in our human nature. We don't like it. Uh, you like for a movie to end on a happy note. You like for a book to end on a happy note. There's something down in you that tells you it ought to be that way. And if I'm talking to somebody here tonight that's never been saved, you've never trusted Christ, your end is not going to be a happy end. Uh, God's stories have to do with his people. He has a happy ending for his people, but there's nothing said about somebody else's people. And, and I know heaven is very unreal to some of my congregation tonight. There have been times when it's been very unreal to me, sad to say. And one of the great uh, tragedies of modern Christianity is the fact that heaven has ceased to be real to hundreds and thousands of Christians. Now, I'm talking about saved people. Uh, say people that conceive of heaven as kind of a glorified earth. Two little boys were talking. One was from Little Rock, Arkansas, and one was from Dallas, Texas. And the boy from Dallas said, uh, my grandpa died and said he's up in heaven now. And the little boy from Little Rock said, my granddaddy died too and he went to heaven. And then the little boy from Arkansas said, do you reckon our grandpas will know each other up there in heaven? And the first little boy said, no, no they won't because my granddad went to a Texas heaven. <laughs> And you know the lot of truth in that, the way people look at things? Uh, I talked with a German lady one time, and she, I finally convinced her that New Jerusalem was coming down from God out of heaven and not Berlin. And when I finally convinced her that, uh, that New Jerusalem was coming down from God out of heaven, she said, yes, but it's going to come down over Germany, isn't it? <laughs> you know, you, you keep thinking of the thing in the, in the pattern of what you know down here. It's hard to think about spiritual things you've never seen. It's hard to love things you've never seen, never felt, never smelled, never touched. We're so constituted, we just love the things that we see and hear and smell and touch and taste. That's the way we are. And uh, if I didn't know modern Christianity was an apostasy any other way than by the hymnal, I'd know it by the hymnal. Because you go through the hymnal and where are the songs about heaven? You get them here, we had to put a half a dozen of them in. And even some of you sing them, you sing them kind of embarrassed like. As this age wears on, it, uh, Christians are getting more worldly by the minute. The saved people, the born again people. And uh, uh, the truth of the matter is, heaven today is just about as unreal to a Christian today as it was to an agnostic and atheist a hundred years ago. And uh, Christians don't like to sing about heaven. They don't like to think about heaven. Uh, the great emphasis of Christianity today is on institutions and works, and works, and works. If I handle my business like some of my brethren handle it, you know what I'd be talking about from morning to night? I'd be talking about the Pensacola Bible Institute from morning to night. And I don't talk about it from morning to night. I very rarely even mention it. 
sometimes even to mention. Some of the brethren get all shook up like they had the case of the hives or something. Listen, you ought to hang out with some places where I've been and see them. Promote that thing from morning to night, seven days a week, 365 days a year, in their sleep. You know what's wrong with a bunch of people? They've got the whole thing down here, and it's supposed to be up there. Your affection set on things above, not on things on this earth. I'm going to preach tonight about a place you've never seen. And maybe some of you might think I'm crazy. Say, well, what good is that? What's practical about that? I'm going to preach about the dearest place I know of tonight. I'm going to preach about the place where I'm heading, and I just soon head tonight as tomorrow night. Matter of fact, I'd rather. And if the Lord wants to come tonight and take me home, there's nothing I've got here I can't drop, and you help yourself. You just have the whole thing. As far as I'm concerned, it can just wind up tonight. Because I know where I'm going, I know how to get there, and I know what's waiting there when I get there. You say, would you take a chance on something like that you've never seen? Yes, sir, I would. You say, why so? Because I've been on this old mess down here for 49 years, and I know what's down here. And it ain't here. It ain't here. Folks say, well, you know, he's just bitter in life, and he's just sour. Yes, I know you old carnal rascal, <laughs> you old godforsaken <laughs> reprobate. I know what your problem is. I, I bet you can't find a man in this world that loves living any more than I do. Bet you can't. Bet you can't. I enjoy the sun. I enjoy the moon. I enjoy the stars. I enjoy the bushes and the trees and the ground and the grass, man. I enjoy picking up a handful of sand. I bet you I get as much kick about a billion lives as any fellow in this building. But I got good sense, too, and it ain't down here. It's up there. <laughs> it's up there. I haven't got them outline yet. I'm going up here another way. I had another message back here, but I'm going up this way now. But anyway, in Revelation chapter 21 and chapter 22, there's a description of this place. And if you're a child of God, this is where you're going to wind up. And I don't know what your state in life is tonight. I don't know what problems you got, but you probably got some. And if you don't have any, you'll get some. Uh, Christ said, um, while you're in the world, you're going to have tribulation. Be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. And so I know one thing. I know while you're on this earth, you're going to have problems. And I'm going to hold out a delectable morsel to you tonight. I'm going to hold out to chocolate ice cream, soda, watermelon, peanuts, candy, popcorn, everything to you, and try to entice you and seduce you and get you to quit loving this world and get your mind where it ought to be in the first place. All right, now the passage down there says, No more death, nor pain, nor crying, nor sorrow. I make all things new. First of all, I'm going to a place where there's no more pain, and God knows there's enough of it on this earth. I don't know how much you know about pain, but ordinarily people can stand just about anything except pain. And uh, one of the marks of maturity or one of the marks of being grown up is the ability to stand pain. Some of you had more or less than others. But you know something? I'm going to a place, and the text in verse 4 says no more pain. There isn't a woman in this building ever had a child doesn't know something about pain. There isn't a man in this building that ever had a stone doesn't know something about pain. There isn't anybody in this building that's ever been wounded in action doesn't know something about pain. There isn't anybody in this building that ever had an anesthesia wear off in an operation that doesn't know something about pain. And you know something? I'm going to a place where there isn't any pain. And folks say, you're just daydreaming. I'm not daydreaming. Christ said, in my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. But where I am, ye may be also. I'm talking about a literal place. I'm talking about a literal Savior that waits for me at a literal place. And I'm going to a place where I have it on the authority of his word that there's no more pain. Don't you know Richard Wormbrandt be a happy man when he gets to heaven? Amen. Now that man knew something about pain. The communists arrested him and had him in prison for something like 13 years, 1948 to 1956. And when that man was in prison, they tried every way in the world to get him to uh, give him a list of associates and betray other Christians, and he wouldn't do it. They tried every torture known to man, short of killing him, to get him to confess, and he never did. And they took that fellow and... Warren Brown said this. Warren Brown said after three months of tortures of all kind, he said, you get to the place where you'd submit to torture without even questioning rather than take a chance in disobedience. But if they'd torture you if you obeyed and torture you if you disobeyed, and they'd give you worse torture if you disobeyed than if you obeyed. So he said, they used to finally tell us, lie down on the floor. He said, we lay down on the floor. 
and the man would say, raise your feet in the air. We raise our feet in the air, bare souls up. And a fellow would go by and beat the bare soul with an iron rod. Just hurts like blazes. You say, why did they do it? Because if it didn't, they get something worse. Don't you know that man knew something about pain? He was in the dying room there for two and a half years, where once they put a man there, he never came out. And he stayed there two and a half years and watched the men in that room die around him, and he got out and led his guards to Christ while he was in there. That fellow in, in, in solitary confinement about to lose his mind used to have what he called a, a, a love feast uh, to the Lord and a love dance. <laughs> and he, in the dark, he'd dance around that cell and praise God and shout to keep him going crazy. And he said, the Lord was more real to me in those days than he was after I got out. Solitary confinement, got a piece of utensil there and banged on the wall and invented a code and preached the gospel to the fellow in the next solitary banging on the walls with a code going through the, through the walls. Now, don't you know heaven be a wonderful place for him? There are people on this earth that have just hurt and hurt and hurt and hurt all their life. Don't you know God has something set up? Don't you know this life isn't all there is to it? Uh, I, folks, I'll tell you a darn truth. If this place I'm going to talk about tonight is not a real place, I want to get up there, I'm going to accuse the Lord of lying. You say you wouldn't do it. I would too. I would too. I would too. You know something? If there's no place where this thing ends, if there's no place where this mess is over with, the only sensible man on this earth is a dead, sot, drunk. That's a dying truth, man. And yet this Bible says there's a place where it's over. There's a place where there's no more pain. My text says further, no more crying, no more crying. All the tears that have been shed. I talk to people that sit and listen to me, and some of them listen with blank and unresponsive face, and sometimes you respond, and sometimes I get a rise out of you, and sometimes I don't. And yet I'm perfectly well aware of the fact that while I'm talking to you here tonight, I'm talking to a hundred people that have cried themselves asleep at least once this year. I bet you have. I bet you have, and you're saved too. And you say, you've had your problems. Some of you are lonely. Some of you got family trouble, got money trouble, got health trouble. You cried many a night. Yes, sir. You people I'm talking to right now, don't you want to go to a place where you don't cry anymore? Well, I'm going. You say you're crazy. I'm saved. <laughs> I'm not crazy. I'm saved. I'm going to a place where they don't cry. And I'm always suspicious of these kingdom builders. I'm always suspicious of these people are going to bring in this great new thing, whether they're going to bring it down on earth. I've noticed they always have jails for folks that don't agree with them. Have you ever noticed that? They always have sanitariums and mental clinics and things for folks that don't go along with it. And there's going to be no pie on this earth by and by, fella. The pie is in the sky. The pie is in the sky. No more crying. I'm talking to young people who've had your heart broken a thousand pieces. Now, I know folks joke about it, and I joke about it once in a while. That's to keep you in good humor. But, you know, it isn't it anything good to go through. I've been through that. I guess every man and every woman has, maybe somewhere along the line. If you haven't, why, well, you've missed a catastrophe. <laughs> and, you know, when I was about 17 or 18, boy, I went through it. Mm -mm -mm. I wouldn't go back and be that old for nothing. Man, you can have the whole thing. And, you know, in, in those days, it always seems worse than it is. And you just build a mountain, man. You think the world's come to an end. And it isn't really that bad, you know. Five or six years, you kind of get over it, you know. Seven, eight years, you forget all about it. And 30 years later, you know, when you meet her after she's married somebody else, had two or three children, you wonder what in the world ever happened, you know. And it works both ways, you know. It works the way of the women. I mean, some of you girls had some wild crush, you know, when you're about 15 or 16, you thought you never would get over it, you know. Never would get over it. And sat around listening to those songs on the radio, you know, and talk about taking your life and all this and that. And you thought about it, you know. Don't do it. Don't do it. He ain't worth it. <laughs> Don't do it. <laughs> and you go through those things, you know, and it's funny now when you look back, but you know at the time, it's rough. It's rough. And you couldn't count the tears been shed over a thing like that. Broken hearts. He says there'll be a time there'll be no more crying. They all cry. It isn't just young girls that cry. It isn't just young men. It isn't just uh, boys and 15, 16 years old and, you know, some girl on age will love some fellow 19 or 20 and all that rat race, you know. It isn't like that. 
Uh, I know fellows 19, 20, and 21 that ball. And not over broken hearts either. I know fellows 21, 22, and 23 get over there overseas and just get the place they're just half out of the mind sit down and just ball like a four-year-old. I've seen photographs of Marines. One Marine sitting there with his buddy's head in his lap holding on to his head. The fellow down there with his hands over his face just crying and fill a, fill a helmet full of tears. That fellow 25 is trying to mother that kid, you know, about 21 years old. They all cry. They all cry. This world, brethren, is a veil of tears. Now, I don't say that as a pessimist. Now, I don't say that as somebody that's gloomy. I bet I can tell more jokes than anybody in this building. <laughs> that's all. That's all I can remember the sermon anyway, the joke, you know. Somebody phoned me up the other day, in the, uh, and they said, I heard your program last Sunday, a lady did. She said, I just want to tell you how much we enjoyed it. She said, first time we heard you, she said, my husband thought you were a comedian. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I enjoy a good joke. I enjoy it. But you know something? I've got better sense than to think this whole life and this whole world is a bowl of cherries. It's a veil of tears, brother. It's a veil of tears. And someday it's going to end. Someday I'm going to never shed another tear by anything. I'm just going to start shouting and just shout and shout and shout and shout. And voice never get out of me either. Just keep on going. I've seen some people cry. You know, I like to see a person cry when they get saved. I know tears don't save them. I know that. And I know you can't get saved but crying and repenting all over the place. I know that. But still there's something about it that just, uh, it's just a blessing. Uh, maybe they don't all mean business, but it looks like they do. <laughs> and, you know, one time I had a meeting over in Mobile. I saw a fellow cry over there. One time he cried so hard, just shook me all to pieces. I was preached over there in the Mobile Rescue Mission, and I got through with a message, and before we could sing the invitation, a young man got up there about 19 years old, and he stood up by a seat near the aisle, tears just raining down his face. And he said, Preacher, he said, I want to get saved. And I said, well, uh, come on. And he took about two steps out of that thing, and he was crying so hard he couldn't see where he was going, and he stumbled over one of the seats coming down. And then he dropped on his knees in the aisle like this and tried to walk on his knees, and he took about three steps on his knees and fell on his face. And that fellow crawled to that altar in his face, just leaving a, a thing behind him he could have mopped up with a mop. Shake you, man. Shake your soul. See that guy? I don't know what he had in his mind. I don't know what he had in his heart. God only knows. God only knows. God only knows what something you've got in your heart tonight. I don't know. I don't know. But I'll tell you, brother, I spread the feast out like this from sky to sky across a table the angels can sit down at, and I can say, Come ye disconsolate, where are ye languish? Come to the mercy seat, fervently kneel. Here bring your wounded heart. Here bring all your anguish. Earth hath no sorrow. Heaven cannot heal. Brother, you're going to a place where they don't cry. You're going to be all through with it. You're never going to do it again. Nobody's ever going to hurt your feelings. Nobody's ever going to break your heart. Nobody's ever going to lie to you. God's not going to take you, your baby, anymore. God's not going to take your mother anymore. You're not going to see the devil get your kids anymore. You're not going to get laid off anymore. You're not going to get fired anymore. You're just going to go through and never cry again. Don't you want to go to a place like that? You say, is that place real you're telling me about? It's real or the Lord did tell you the truth. Look down there in verse 5. Doesn't verse 5 say right for these words are true and faithful? Is that verse 5? It doesn't say right for these words are symbolical and figurative. It says right for these words are true and faithful. So I'm going to a place where there's no more crying. That isn't all. I'm going to a place where there's no more sorrow. You know, you can have sorrow without tears. And I've seen people so struck down with grief, they couldn't even cry. Psychiatrists say that's a dangerous thing. I don't know whether it is or not, but I know one thing. I know I'm going to a place where there's no more crying and no more sorrow. And brother, I'll tell you, this world has seen some sorrow. It's seen them. Uh, if you think about, uh, well, I get around and see her once in a while, maybe young down there. Don't you know she's had some sorrowful hour, hours, brother, just sitting in that chair and wheeling herself around that room, in the hospital, out of the hospital, in the hospital, out of the hospital. We go fishing, she doesn't fish. Some of you go hunting, she doesn't hunt. You go play golf, she don't play golf. 
Just moved around that little old house down there, about four rooms, not big enough for anybody else to stay. Moves around there, don't you know? She's had some sorrowful hours. Don't you know, uh, don't you know, uh, over there at the county home, Mr. Sawyer's had some hours? You drive a car, she can't drive a car. Why, you know something? I bet she'd give all the money you got in your pocket and more, too, if she could just uh, get out one time and just uh, go someplace and sit down and watch a ball game, let alone play one. Don't you know been some sorrowful hours, brother? When does it end? The United Nations says we're working on it. Oh, get off that stuff. <laughs> they ain't going to do anything. There's nothing medicine going to do that the science going to do. Last night at the Bible class, Brother Hartman came around to me and he said, I thought you'd be interested in this. And he showed me some statistics on the causes of death in America between 1920 and 1970. And it showed, you know, heart diseases and pneumonia and uh, oh, cancer and all that and diabetes. And it showed how much uh, they'd conquered all these diseases and yet cancer had increased and heart trouble had increased. And when he got figured out all those totals, you know what he had? He had the increase over this disease was so much and the decrease over these was so much. And the total figure was a 2.7 decrease in finding cures for disease. All right, Revelation chapter 21, beginning at verse 1 and coming down through about... Uh, For you? They conquered consumption. They conquered scarlet fever. They conquered smallpox. They couldn't conquer cancer. They couldn't conquer heart disease. And the thing averaged out with a total of 2.7 drop. But it was a, there was a 2.7 less chance you'll live in 1970 than in 1920. That's science for you. They're going to work it out. Big improvement. As I said before, I'm afraid of these man-made heavens. I, I've seen every one of them. When Hitler started to bring in a Third Reich, he had a concentration camp for people who didn't believe in it. When Karl Marx and Lenin and Stalin and Trotsky set up that great new Bolshevist revolution, they had a chopping block for folks that wouldn't go along with it. And I've observed when anybody starts a movement like this ecumenical movement or this integration movement, they always have a jail for folks that don't agree with it. You ever notice that? Listen, God has a heaven up there and a place reserved for you, and there's, there's, no, there's no penalty up there. When you get up there, brother, it's just song and dance forever. No crying, no sorrow, no pain, no death, for the former things have passed away. Behold, I make all things new. Why, there are people on this earth that have lived lives of sorrow that you never knew about, never heard about, and the papers never said anything about them. They never even mentioned I don't know whether you know it or not. Right now, I know you know about the Vietnam prisoners that aren't released. I know, you about, I know you know about the Korean prisoners that aren't released. But did you know something? In World War II, at the end of that war, <clears throat> the Russians took off into captivity over 200,000 German boys. What do you suppose happened to them? You say, well, who cares? They were Germans. Well, that's how it goes, isn't it? See? I mean, folks worry about our boys. Don't worry about their boys. Did you know somewhere tonight there's probably 50,000 to 100,000 German mothers still alive that saw their boy go off in 1940 and never saw him come back? You know where he died? He froze up in Siberia if he's still alive. And if he's still alive, he'd be uh, 50 and 55 and 60 years old. What's left of him? 200,000 of them. You just don't hear about those things. They didn't, they didn't repatriate anybody. They didn't send them back. And folks said, well, it was a war of aggression, you know, and they deserve it. Well, some folks call Vietnam a war of aggression, too, you know. So you have to be careful about those things. And there are all kinds of sorrows in this world that I know nothing about. There are Chinese mothers crying the night over their starving children. There are Hindu mothers crying over their starving children. There are people down in Cuba that have been in jail for 15 years, and they're just wasted skeletons, wasting away. This place, a veil of sorrows. And I mean, I mean to accent the negative to drive it home. I mean it, and I do it deliberately. There's too much earth and world for this generation of Christians. Rather than somewhere, we've got to get on heavenly ground. Do you know it's easy to give when you're on heavenly ground? You know it's easy to read your Bible? It's easy to study your Bible? It's the easiest thing in the world. It's like fall off a log if you're walking on the clouds. If you're walking down here, it's so difficult. It's so hard. It's such a, such a load. 
Sorrow, sorrow, sorrow. Sorrow in the families. Divorce is going up one out of three. I think in a couple of counties last year, the more divorces, the more marriage. I don't know how you work that out statistically, but I guess you start having uh, two divorces for every marriage or something before you get through. And those things go along like that. Children caught in the middle of those things, batted back and forth between the parents. Sorrow, brother, sorrow. I talked to a young couple one time at Robertsdale, and I wouldn't mention the name, but they came over and talked to me for a while. I fished around here and there and tried to get any solution I'd get my hands on, and I couldn't see what the trouble was. It didn't seem like there should be any trouble. They had two fine young boys, and they were young people, about, well, early 20s, and both of them saved, both of them raised in church, both of them saved when they got married. And I kept trying to find some grounds they could work out without breaking things up. And I told them what would happen if they did break up, and told them if they had to, why well, such and such would follow, and this and that. And I told them by all means, if they possibly could, to stay together, and this and that. When I got all through, I said, uh, I said, well, I said, uh, it didn't get anywhere. I said, well, look at here. I said, when you two married each other, you must have loved each other. I said, uh, what, what's going wrong? I said, when you got married, you must have loved each other. And the woman, the girl, laughed. And uh, I said, well, that's strange. I said, why do you laugh? She said, uh, we had to get married. She laughed again. She didn't love him. She didn't love him. Well, I don't know what that family's doing. I don't know what those two boys are doing. But, brother, I know one thing. I know this old world is a veil of tears. And don't you ever kid yourself. It's a sorrowful place. And every Christian this building tonight, you ought to be a realist. And you ought to be hungry for God and hungry for heaven. All right, my text says no more sorrow, neither pain nor death, but former things have passed away. My text says no more death. You know death's a miserable thing. I've had to arrange funerals, and I know every pastor has, but they're miserable things. It's a miserable thing to get in that phone, phone down there and say, come for the body, you know, and the body's at such such a place, and it'll be at the hospital, and pick it up at the Baptist Hall, all that kind of business, you know, and especially when it's somebody you know. That's a miserable, wretched business. We all do it. We have to. We're supposed to do it. I don't mind doing it for the Lord and the calling, but I mean just talking like one man, talking to human beings like two ordinary human beings are. It's a miserable business. It's a miserable business. And listen, I thank God I'm going to play sometime where I'll never have to phone one up and say, come get the body, because the body will be just like Christ, brother, and it won't be dying. It won't be perishing. I had a make Finn Raymond's for a man recently about his wife, and the poor fellow was just distracted, you know, and the, they, they, I don't care how professional they are and how they try to do the thing right, there's always a kind of a business element about the thing that always just, I don't know, it just, it just doesn't get you, you know. I say, and the fellow said, well, which funeral home do you want to handle it, you know? Well, you've got to choose. You go to the fellow and say, well, which one do you want to have handle it, you know? And the fellow's crying and saying, oh, Brother Pete, I don't know, Brother Pete, I don't know, and so forth and so on. Well, uh, will this be all right? Yes, I guess that'll be all right. You know, I'm going to a place where I never have to fool with that. No crepe on the door, no ambulance, no casket, no little old white box there about two or three feet long and a mother there crying, that kind of thing. I'm going to a place, brother, where I'm not going to see it. I can't wait to go. I don't know who's going to be next. Might be you, might be me. But I know one thing on this earth, there's death, brother. And where I'm going, there's no more death. I never saw a dead man until I was about 15 years old. And some of you probably saw one a lot for them, long for them. When I was about 15 years old, the first dead man I ever saw was the boy that, told me, that taught me how to cuss and steal and lie and told me dirty jokes. His name was Bill Phelps, and he was 18 years old. He lived in Topeka, Kansas. And old Bill Phelps was uh, flunk. He'd flunked two whole grades. And back in those days, when you flunked, you know, they put you back a whole grade. They didn't give you a social promotion, you know, try to get you a job when you got out. They flunked you, man. You took the whole thing over. And so he was 18 years old, going along with the kids 15 and 16. And the first corpse I ever saw was his corpse. And I remember about a week before he died, I was on a street corner about 11 o'clock at night where I had no business being. And a bunch of fellas around there, and he was talking and kidding and he was saying uh, to the other fellows, why, why, don't we, let's, why don't we take him down to see so-and-so and name somebody and, and let such-and-such-and-so throw into this big old filthy thing, you know, scared me to death. And they all got laughing and joking about it, you know, and I ran on home. And about a week later, that fellow was going to a basketball game, took a bunch of young people with him, 
And they got in the car, and they're going down that road about 65 and drinking on the way, and he hit something slippery, went off that road and hit a culvert and sheared that car in two, and he was pinned under the car, rolling over a couple of times, lying there with on, on his legs, and the legs just mashed, I mean, clean to the bone. And he bled to death out there in the highway under that car before they could get any help to him. That's the first dead man I ever saw. We went out there, and I remember walking by that cask and looking at that fellow, 18 years old, looking at that thing, looking at that thing, and wondering, wondering, you know, is he in that box? Is he in that box? Well, where is he? Is that him? Was that him in that box? No, is he gone someplace? He's still in the box, or is he going to wake up? I didn't know nothing. I didn't know nothing. But I've seen a lot of them since then. And I thank God for a book that says there's a place where there's no more death. And that's the place I want to go. Well, I went to the ROTC at the University of Kansas when I was a young man on the ROTC at the University of Alabama, and the classes I was, I, I was in, those two places, graduated 200 officer candidates, 200 of them. I've met four of them since World War II, and I've never heard of any of them since then, four of them since World War II. And I moved back to Alabama when I came back. I got four out of 200. I don't know where the other 196 are, there might be four or five of them around someplace. There might be a hundred of them around someplace. I don't know. But uh, the bunch I went in was all activated in 1941. I bet I know where most of them are. They're in hell. They're in hell. They're dead and in hell. That's where they are. They're dead. And they're in hell. We didn't come up with the Christian crowd. We never heard it. I never heard it at a time. They're dead and in hell. Some fellow I sat there in that R.T. class, R.T. class, worked with, raised man, asked questions. He's over there in Tarawa, buried down that sand, brother. Sand across the ear, sand across the body. Tide come in washing over him. Here's another one. He's up in Iwo Jima. Put him in a hole, bulldoze him over. Take out the dog tags, bulldoze him over, brother. Put the cross up in the hill. Body ain't within 300 yards of that pit, brother, on that, that cross. That cross just up there to look at. I know where they are. The dead. The dead, and they're in the hell. And I'm going to a place where there's no more death. And when I get up there, I'm not going to have to say goodbye to my friends and goodbye to my neighbors. I'm not going to have to say goodbye to my children. I'm not going to say goodbye to the Christians I've worked with and prayed with and sweat with and cried with and preached with and taught. I'm going to be up there forever and ever with them, and I'm going to enjoy it, man. Will you meet me at the fountain when I reach the glory land? Will you meet me at the fountain? Shall I clasp your friendly hand? Other friends will give you welcome. Other loving voices cheer. There'll be music at the fountain. Will you meet me there? Will you meet me at the fountain? For I'm sure I shall know kindred souls in sweet communion more than I've ever known below. And the chorus will be sweeter when it bursts upon my ear and my heaven seem completer if your happy voice I hear. Will you meet me at the fountain? I shall long to have you near. When I meet my loving Savior, when his welcome words I hear, he will meet you at the fountain. His embrace you shall share. There'll be glory at the fountain. Will you meet me, meet me there? Her voice comes back to us this afternoon. Will you meet me there? Can we say, yes, I'll meet you at the fountain, at the fountain, bright and fair? Or oh, I'll meet you at the fountain. Yes, I'll meet you, meet you there. It's going to be great. Get a place where you never die. Have you got a home in heaven? I know you got one down here. You got one up there? If you had to vacate, you got any place to move into? <laughs> Christ said, In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you that where I am, ye may be also. And someday, I don't know how soon, I don't know where or when, you and I are going to wake up there at his feet, and there it's going to be, and you won't even believe it. You'll probably be like uh, Thomas or... Those disciples, when the Lord came in and said, Touch me and see, for a spirit hath not flesh and bones, you see me have. And while they believed not, he came down there and said, Look at here, here's my hands and my feet. You say, Why are you drawing that picture like that? I'm, I'm drawing the Lord coming down to meet him. You see, the Lord has stepped down. He always would come down. He always would come down. It's just like him. It's just like him to come down. The Bible said he laid his glory aside. And I bet the day you show up, I don't care who stand out there in the ranks, Abraham Isaac or Jacob or Savannah Roller or Martin Luther or John Wesley or any of the rest of them, I bet he'll come down and meet you at the fountain, boy. There's a lady out in Dallas, Texas. Her name was Mrs. Carmody. And Mrs. Carmody uh, married a banker. And they had a big old wedding, and she and the banker traveled around the world for years, were known all the uh, society circles of Dallas. 
And when that woman died, they had a splendid funeral, and people talked about how happy she was and what a splendid man she married and this and that and other thing. And yet, you know something? That woman, all her life, she wanted a home. She wanted to live in a home. And she lived 49 years in a hotel. The fellow she married just liked a hotel suite instead of a home. And when that woman died, after being married for 49 years, 49 years, you know what they found? They found her wedding presents for her home still wrapped up, and they'd been unopened. She kept them for 49 years. One of them was an urn that cost uh, $1,260. One of them was candelabra and a, a picture that cost $2,260. There were four trunk loads of, of drapings and furnishings for a home, and eat, the content of each one of them was worth over $1,000. And that woman just had them packed up, and they were never unpacked the day she died. And the day she died, they took that stuff and they donated it to the Museum of Fine Arts in Dallas. And that woman all her life, and I don't know whether she was saved or not, but that woman, all her life, she wanted a home, and she never had one. She never got one. And the day she died, all the stuff she was going to put in her home just laid around wrapped up, she never got any home to put it into. Uh, isn't, that, isn't that a picture of a lot of folks down here? I mean, just working in the slave and to get up all this junk and get all this stuff together, and you ain't got a place to put it. <laughs> and you die, going to go on, you got no home to move into. And I'll tell you something else. You know the beauty of this thing? The beauty of this thing is the Lord's got this thing worked out to where you can have a home and you don't have to be a millionaire. You don't have to have any money at all. You know what the Lord will do for you? He'll, he'll get a home for you and completely furnish the thing and have it all ready for you when you get there. And it doesn't take any kind of a thing to get it. The Bible says, Precious Messiah of the Lord is the death of his saints. Down here some poor beggar dies downtown the streets. And, uh, you know, the police come by and pick it up, you know, investigator and stuff, and get him off and bury him in the potter's field. <laughs> you know, and up there in heaven they're saying, lift up ye gates, lift up your doors, O everlasting gates, you know, and let him come in. Down here, you know, some fellow dies, somebody says, boy, well, he's gone, thank God he's gone. And up there in glory they say, enter into the joy of thy Lord. It's so different. Down here there's sort of some poor wretch pass away, and somebody says, well, poor father, you know, poor father. Don't you poor father him. Listen, if he dies in Christ, he's in better shape than you're in. Paul says it's better to be absent from the body and present with the Lord. To depart and be with Christ, he says, is far better. Some fellow dies down here and they say, well, don't touch that one, you know, he's no good. And uh, Christ says, come ye blessed of my father and inherit the kingdom bread you from the foundation of the world. Somebody takes some loved one down in this earth and looks at him and they say, I'm sorry, he's got a fatal ailment. He's got a fatal ailment. He's dying. And up in heaven they say, good, he's coming home. <laughs> you see how different it is? Down here they say, poor soul, poor soul, poor fella. Don't you ever poor soul or poor fella me if you stand by my casket. I'll sure be better off if you will be, I'll guarantee you. <laughs> You'll still be down here fighting these communists and waiting for the devil to take over. You'll still be down here fighting the seekers, sex education, watching the devil get your kids. You'll still be down here paying taxes and getting these census things taken to you and metro government to wrestle with, you know, and tax exempt going to the churches and watching your kids grow up and worry about them, worry yourself sick about them. I'll be better in shape you'll be in. Don't poor, don't poor fellow me, man, if it comes. If it comes, I'm going to be up there having me a shouting good time. You know what it's going to be like? It's going to be like the day that old Fib Mephibosheth was brought in before David. Mephibosheth was brought in for before David. He said, uh, What is thy servant, a dead dog such as I am, that you should look upon thy servant? And old David came down off there and stopped in front of Mephibosheth and said, Listen, he said, From now on you're going to eat at the king's table as one of the king's sons. And he said, All the fruit of that land out there that was worked, I'm going to give to you. It's going to be your fruit. Oh, happy day, brother. And if that book is right, I can stand here and tell you that there's a place up there you're going if you're saved that's more real than that skin on those bones right there. Because worms going to eat that skin. But they're not going to break into heaven where worm doth not corrupt and it can't rust and rot. Let's stand for prayer. Father, bless the message tonight. Make heaven real to our hearts. And 
May it be a precious and sweet home to us, as we know it must be. And, Lord, I pray that you'll put these words and this verse in the heart of every Christian here. May there be a heavenly-minded people and a far-sighted people. Not a near-sighted people, but a far-sighted. May they take the long look, Lord. And if they can't have 20-20 vision, give them far-sightedness, Lord, so they can see the end and calculate on it. The heads are bowed and eyes are closed. We're tired just a few minutes. Now, I think most of you people here tonight are saved, as I said before. Maybe all of you. I know most of you. But maybe somebody got in here tonight, you don't have a home. Well, Christ purchased you a home and died for your sin and was buried and rose from the dead. You'll take him as your Savior. He'll give you a home where there's no crying, no sorrow, no pain, no death. And you may be having a tough time of it tonight. But there's going to come a day when you're going to be through with it. If you'll take God the Son as your Savior. All our heads are bowed and eyes are closed. Is there anybody, anybody in this building, raise your hand and say, Preacher, I'm not saved. I'm not a child of God. I need Christ. Would you pray for me? Would you raise the hand, please? If that's your situation. I'm not saved. I'm not a child of God. Would you raise the hand? Anywhere in the building. Now, Father, undertake for us tonight. And if anybody got in here on the sea, I pray this, leave this building saved, washed in the blood, crossing what you did for them on Calvary's cross. Bless our baptismal service to follow in our fellowship. May you have the preeminent place in all things, in our lives, in our speech, and our actions, Lord. And help us to be faithful this week in our meeting our appointments and visiting the sick and witnessing to the lost. And, Father, keep us heavenly minded by your grace in the days that lie ahead. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Maybe you seated just a minute, please. And if you...